Hi guys. So it's Thursday. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wishful thinking on my part. It's Wednesday. So happy Wednesday. Um, today I'm going to wrap up a basic understanding of the description essay mode. And then uh, we're going to work towards the assignment uh, that will be due on Monday. Uh, it's called music reviews. Okay. Uh, so on the screen I have open here, you notice it says Allende, Amazon Queen. That's the essay I want to talk about for about 15 minutes, and then we'll shift to the music review examples. Uh, essentially, what's going to end up happening, you will be writing a music review with heavy uh, descriptions of music. Okay. Um, and remember, since I'm the primary reader of the text, the material you'll post in your writing will be um, educating me on the type of music that you're reviewing. Excuse me. Okay. So um, let's start out with uh, Amazon Queen itself proper. This is one of my favorite authors. Uh, she's modern. She's uh, living today. Uh, you may have heard of her first novel, which is called um, The House of Spirits. She is from South America, and she's a, had a very rich and experienced life, uh, adventures in her own right. Um, the quality of her work is based on what's called magic realism. It's an art movement that started up roughly in the 1970s. Um, so it is it's sort of a mix between surrealism and realism. Uh, just to give you a quick example of a surrealistic painting, I'm going to Google And let's start with the persistence of memory. This one is a classic example that people more often than not recognize with the melting clocks. And as it loads up here, I'll make it even bigger. Here you go. So this is uh, Salvador Dali. He's in uh, Spain, but his method of painting surrealism shows a nightmarish, or you could say even daydreamy sort of psychological uh, symbolism. And basically he can put whatever he wants on the canvas and for instance, like the melting clock itself with this beetle-like creature here with this odd shaped shadow um, or this melted human head sort of creature with his oversized eye and tongue. Um, so these are examples of imagery that the viewer takes away what they want to or what how they perceive it, they apply their own personal symbol. Well, like this one down here with the clock covered in ants. I mean, there is no specific interpretation that Dolly himself wanted you to get out of this. Um, so he's always, always using the similar landscapes. They're very dreary in a sense, but with these backgrounds of wonderful colors and um, interesting terrains and oceans um, and a lot of evening shadows are being produced and perspective forced perspective but at any rate this is surrealism it's it's not realistic it's odd it's supposed to make you uncomfortable in a manner of speaking you apply the meanings you want to to the painting um, whereas you already know what realism is that's something photorealistic and very intense and very obvious. So you combine the two together, you get magic realism. 
in magic realism, it's promoting the fact that the world is illogical and oftentimes acts on its own um, set of rules that are unexplainable. Um, and you shouldn't try to understand the confusing aspects of the world. Uh, the example I always use a couple of years ago within my lifetime it was probably before you were born uh, in Maine, for example, uh, I believe it was, it was in New England. Um, it was a calm, beautiful blue day, Cla some puffy clouds, but for the most part, uh, cloudless. And it was in the mid afternoon and suddenly in this small town, suddenly all these fish were raining from the sky that covered the streets and no one could explain where the source of these fish came from. Um, there had been no hurricane storms out in the, in the Atlantic and there was no overhead commercial traffic of fish. So it was left unexplained, but, that's an example of how illogical things happen in the world that defy explanation. And what the magic realists want to do is you just accept it. You don't try to understand it. You look at the poetry in the event and you move on. So keeping all that in mind, what we have here is an essay by Isabel Allende, and she is one of the top Latin writers. Um, she currently is an American citizen uh, and she primarily writes in Spanish and then the work is translated over by the same translator. She always works with the same work, uh, the same translator to interpret her material, uh, even though she's very fluent in English. Uh, so in this essay in particular, it's not a example of magic realism. It's an example of how magic realism can influence realistic writing. So again, this is a tweaking of the hybrid notion of realism and surrealism. This is leaning more towards the realistic concept of the world. Okay. So, um, I'm only going to talk about it for like 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I do want you to try and uh, take the time to read the full essay. It, it's beautifully written. It's very descriptive. And even if you can't understand the specific geographical points she's referencing, you at least can visualize them in your head and you can understand her point of view. That's the descriptive aspect that I want you to take away from this essay. Um, so if you look at the opening, right away, it says a powerful dream led me to the Amazon. That's a great topic sentence. It, it gathers attention right away. And she's tell she's embellishing her history of uh, dream like imagery. She's in, um, incorporating that whole notion of dreams into her essay. And, and, um, so uh, it's called The Amazon Queen because she's writing a essay, which is basically a travel log or a travel journey, I'm sorry, a journey diary to encourage other people to travel. And in this case, the Amazon is the jungle itself, the river and the jungle that's a part of South America. So in this case, the topic sentence, it tells you immediately, it's because of a dream she ended up actually visiting the Amazon. And so now she's going to qualify that explaining why. So for three years, I had been blocked, unable to write with a feeling that the torrent of stories waiting to be told, which once had seemed inexhaustible had dried up. Then one night, I dreamed of four naked Indians emerging from the heart of South America, carrying a large box, a gift for a conquistador. And as they crossed jungles, rivers, mountains, and villages, the box absorbed every sound, leaving the world in silence. Then song of the birds, the murmuring of the wind, human stories, all were swallowed up. 
I awakened with the conviction that I must go there to look for that voracious box, where perhaps I could find voices to nourish my inspiration. It took a year to realize that wondrous journey. So this is a wonderful paragraph all on its own. Uh, so the first thing I want to point out is notice she mentions the four naked Indians emerging from the heart of South America. It's a very imagistic description, atypical of what most people think of when you say South America and, and jungles. Um, it's very stereotypical as well. It's very sentimental. It's over emotional uh, of generating these four creatures carrying this box in, in the magic fantasy aspect of the dream, uh, a gift for a conquistador. Um, so Allende is specifically targeting the stereotype for a point. And in a few minutes, I'll show you how she counters this example. So remember this dreamy, sentimental, over-emotional, um, romantic notion of native South Americans. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to point out is the word voracious right here. Voracious is a wonderful word in English. Voracious means hungry, greedy, devouring. So this box that she shows you is basically a, um, a little mouth devouring anything it can get its lid on, so to speak. Um, the other point I want to make, she's had writer's block for three years, and that is pure torture. For someone who's a creative writer, going three years without being able to write anything, that's torture. I understand what she's going through when she wrote that line. Um, I myself went through a five-year period where I couldn't write. Uh, part of it was circumstantial. Part of it was psychological. I just was getting mad at the writing industry. Uh, I wasn't connecting to other writers or to any of the publishers, and I was just, I felt like I was wasting my time and stuck in a rut, so I just said, the hell with it, stop writing. Um, but there's danger in doing that, uh, especially in college. Now, I'm turning it back on you. When you're in college, you're going to be doing a lot of writing. Uh, so if you find yourself in a writer's block mode, fight it tooth and nail. Don't succumb to it and just let it control you. You got to break through that cycle. Uh, looking at the second paragraph, uh, she opens up with a question. Now, in your own writing, avoid hypothetical rhetorical questions. Do not use questions in your research writing or in your personal writing, for that matter. In English, it is viewed as a delayed tactic. You're stalling. And for instructors, it adds a little irritation that you're trying to meet word count by throwing in some questions. D don't use them. Avoid them. But in this case, this is how she's introducing her main topic. This is a description essay. So notice she says, how shall I describe the Amazon? And then she gives you promptly a strict, basic, scientific definition of the geographical region. And it says the Amazon occupies 60% of Brazil, an area larger than India, and extends into Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. Okay, so notice she starts with a scientific and now she's going to shift to the creative. From the airplane, it is a vast green world. Below, on the ground, it is a kingdom of water, vapor, rain, rivers, broad as ocean sweat. So um, she it closes that paragraph off with a very elaborate, very detailed, beautiful sentence. Um, creatively based. It's a wonderful simile comparing the whole notion of the atmosphere of the Amazon to ocean sweat. 
uh, one could even say that about the Houston area in late summer when that humidity um, pressure system lowers down on us and um, right before the hurricane season hits. Uh, now, for the most part, this is not in chronological order. She's going to start falling into what's called emphatic organization. At first, it does sound chronological. So she starts with her trip to the Amazon, but then she's going to go by emphatic, important details. Um, her sensory impressions are very important to this essay. So any personal essay you write, the more sensory impressions you provide, any of the five major senses, give those details in your descriptions. That builds a connection between you and the reader. Specifically, um, other than sight, uh, smell and sounds are often ignored by writers. You got to remember the smell carries a lot of memory factors. Uh, likewise with sound. If you hear a siren just a few miles down the road, that carries a lot of traumatic um, possibilities of tragedy, of depression. So just mentioning a siren uh, brings up issues for certain readers. It's a good tactic to use within your writing uh, for metaphor and simile. Um, okay. I'm shifting now to page two when she's actually there with a guide. Uh, and she's at, oh, here, let me go back to page one for a second. It says, following the Rio Negro um, to this eco hotel constructed in the treetops. So she's landed in a region where she's going to start doing a tourist ex exploration of the Amazon. Um, so this hotel consists of several towers connected by passageways open to monkeys, parrots, every insect known to man, chicken wire everywhere prevents animals from coming into the rooms, especially monkeys, which can wreck as much destruction as an elephant. Uh, and she's going to go walking with a guide through the thick underbrush of the actual jungle. Um, now, this novel she mentions here, finally, I understood the meaning of the last line of a famous Latin American novel, He Was Swallowed Up by the Jungle. I always found it interesting she never mentions the title of this famous novel. It took me years, but I finally found it. It's called The Vortex. And it's been translated in the English, I believe it was in the 1940s, but um, it, 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 it is in the common book. Uh, it's very rare to find a copy. Uh, nonetheless, that is the last line of the novel. The protagonist is basically given up on life, so to speak, and wanders off into a jungle, just swallows up in, in the jungle. Um, why she doesn't mention the title, I don't know, but at any rate, that is what she's referencing, the vortex. Um, now, let me shift over here. Remember the introduction with the Indians, the four naked Indians carrying the gift? It, again, very romantic, sentimental. Uh, on this case, she's going to actually visit a native village. Notice this paragraph here, how it's structured. Okay, uh, and what, de what details she provides. Another day, we went to a native village, which was in fact the habitat of a single extended family. They were the Satir Mai Indians who had been evicted from their lands and forced to immigrate to the city where they ended up in a slum dying of hunger. The owner of the hotel had given them some land where they could return to living in harmony with their traditions. We arrived at their village late one afternoon by boat at the hour of mosquitoes. Uh, again, I love that closing line, that, that whole statement of the hour of mosquitoes. <clears throat> that reminds me of Houston again in late July. Uh,
especially after a rain. Those creatures pop up all of a sudden everywhere. But this is a more realistic portrayal of the native people. Um, you also get a sense of the social economic situation for them and the politics behind the, the these inhabitants. Um, due to progress and civilization and uh, colonization, the, the people are being displaced and basically they're dying of hunger. So if you remember the demo, when I first went over description essays and we talked about objective and subjective here, this paragraph is actually very subjective, but it's subtle. Her language is being objective. So meaning she's not, um, targeting a specific person, blaming them for the conditions of the, the, the circumstances of these people. However, through the brutal reality of the situation, you do realize she has a compassion for them. Um, she's not just utilizing their image to promote the his, not, I'm sorry, not history, but uh, promoting the progress of her walking through the Amazon. She has a point in bringing them up, in other words. Uh, this counters the opening image in the introduction with the, the four wandering Indians. So um, this is yet another reason why I love this essay so much is because she's very self-aware of what she's picking and of the politics she wants to mention within her own writing. She does have subtle messages within the text. Um, when we look at the music reviews, be very careful and be able to distinguish between being subjective and being objective. So when you're being objective, you're not negative or you're not accusing uh, someone of a flaw or being overtly critical, but when you're being subjective, you are being very specific with your opinion. It's very clear how you feel negative or positive about a situation or music. Okay, so that's the first two pages. Uh, I would like for you to finish the essay. It's only four pages unto itself. And then you get a little brief bio on page five. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop the video at this point so that you can take a pause and relax. Um, and then I'm going to create a second video, which talks a shorter video, which is going to talk about the assignment that's coming out of this project and talk about the music reviews. Okay. Um, so I'll see you in a few seconds.